Hey guys, today I'll show you a sci-fi horror TV series named Stranger Things, Season 4, Part 2. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. Previously in Part 1, when the monster was casting its spell, the light bulbs of the flashlights in Victor's house suddenly exploded as if unable to withstand the enormous magnetic field energy. The Hawkinstown police received a report late at night and rushed to the riverside. All they found was a terrified Jason sitting on the shore, cradling the corpse of his follower. When questioned by the police, Jason rambled, refusing to say who brought up the body or explain what had happened. Instead, he insisted that Eddie was a vessel for Satan, capable of killing invisibly. The policeman could only begin a search in the vicinity, but Eddie had already fled, even stealing a walkie-talkie from a local construction worker. The next day, Dustin was preparing to deliver food to Eddie's hiding place. When he approached the house, he found a crowd of onlookers. The chief was being interviewed by the media, reporting the discovery of a corpse in Lover's Lake and publicly naming Eddie as a suspect. Now, Eddie was framed as a serial killer and was wanted by the police. Eddie hid in the forest, daring not to show his face, and could only ask Dustin for help through the walkie-talkie. Dustin and others believed in his innocence and rushed to find Eddie. Eddie was hiding at a place called Skull Rock. Although it was a popular dating spot in the town, the exact route was not marked on the map. Dustin only knew the general direction and volunteered to lead the way with a compass. Unexpectedly, the compass failed halfway through, and they wandered around following Dustin. Fortunately, Steve found Skull Rock based on his past experiences. While everyone was meeting up, a news conference was being held in town. Sheriff Powell intended to announce a curfew, ordering citizens to stay home until the criminal was caught to prevent further incidents. However, the citizens were not satisfied, criticizing the police for their inefficiency. After the first victim, the police failed to solve the murder case, which resulted in a second victim. Powell tried to reassure the public, promising to arrest Eddie soon, but his words were ignored. Jason, playing the contrarian, further tarnished the police's reputation. He believed that he knew the truth and pieced together the whole thing. Hawkins was plagued by a satanic cult, disguised as the Hellfire Club in high school, working for Satan throughout the town. This explained the frequent strange occurrences in the town over the past three years. He claimed that Eddie was the cult leader, and each murder was a sacrificial ritual. He even claimed that the police were after Eddie, but in reality, they wanted to conceal the truth. Erica, sitting in the audience, voiced her opposition, but her words were dismissed and she was restrained by her parents. Naturally, she couldn't change the public's opinion. In the end, all the members of the Hellfire Club became accomplices because they were helping to hide Eddie. The crowd's mood was stirred by Jason's speech. They decided to drive out the evil and save Hawkins, ignoring Powell's curfew order. Only the parents were worried. Their children, who had done nothing wrong, had now become the targets of public outrage. At this moment, Mike and the others had just arrived in Salt Lake City. They were excited to meet Dustin's girlfriend Susie for the first time, but as soon as they knocked on the door, a child dressed as an Indian shot a toy slingshot at Mike. This child was Susie's younger brother. Susie's house was chaotic, but the pizza man and Susie's sister fell in love at first sight. Susie herself was fixing an antenna on the roof. Mike didn't dare to tell her the real purpose of their visit and made up a story on the spot. He said they could find the location of the Nina host through a code. This host was a birthday gift that Dustin had been longing for. Susie was conflicted. She would do anything for Dustin, but she felt guilty for tampering with his grades previously. After confessing to her father, her computer was moved to the study, which was always locked. Even when it was open, her father was inside working, leaving her no chance to access it. However, Susie was a genius. She planned to use her siblings to create an opportunity. While her father was typing in his study, the power was suddenly cut off by Susie's younger brother. As her father rushed downstairs to check, the younger brother turned the power back on. The other children would stall for time, and in those few minutes, Susie and Mike snuck into the study. After some maneuvers, they traced the IP address. By the time Susie's father returned, they had already accomplished their mission. The next step was to find Eleven. Ever since Eleven briefly recovered her superpower, she reconciled with Brenner and accepted his Nina project. Brenner felt that when Eleven was attacked last year, the signals in her brain were also disturbed. Her superpowers were hidden in her subconscious. By stimulating her with traumatic memories, Eleven could break through her self-imposed limits. Dr. Brenner had done similar things before, recording each attempt, although none of them were successful. Eleven had a memory of bloody hands, but it was not detailed enough. Therefore, she entered the saltwater equipment again. In her consciousness, she kept repeating the events of that year. 
The administrator gave her some advice. He said Eleven's determination reminded him of someone, the original superpower being from the lab. But according to Brenner, that person didn't exist. He told Eleven not to trust Brenner completely. He had spent many years with this original superpowered being. They had also been stagnant like Eleven, but they found strength from their angry and sad memories. If Eleven wanted to improve herself, she could try this approach. Eleven remembered the woman who visited her at the Rainbow Room. The woman who was taken away by the guard was her mother. Eleven thought her mother was dead and then realized Brenner had been lying. But before the administrator could reveal the truth, Brenner suddenly walked in. The children were taken to play a game, fighting in pairs using telekinesis. The second superpowered being kept winning until they were defeated by Eleven. Eleven used the administrator's method, but the administrator was electrocuted by Brenner. Even after winning, Eleven was ostracized by the group. They turned off the surveillance and bullied Eleven in the Rainbow Room, warning her not to tell Brenner. Eleven didn't fight back, but when she looked at herself, she was covered in blood. There were terrifyingly dead bodies lying behind her. When she came out of her consciousness, Eleven said in pain that she knew what happened. They were all killed by her. Meanwhile, Joyce and the reporter managed to escape the control of the smuggler. But their airplane was destroyed, crash landing onto an unknown snowy plane. The reporter went around looking for a way out, but as expected, he returned without success. He could only huddle with Joyce by the fire for warmth. The smuggler was tied to a tree in the distance, shivering from the cold. The reporter gave the smuggler one last chance to lead them to the prison. The smuggler tried to bargain, asking for less money. As a result, he was abandoned and would soon become food for the snow bears. Watching the reporter and Joyce leave, the smuggler panicked and finally agreed to the deal. He first took them to his warehouse, where there were food and weapons. They planned to break into the prison at night. This time, the smuggler didn't deceive them. After half a day trekking through the snow, the three of them indeed arrived at a small town. The gray Roof church in town was the smuggler's warehouse. Joyce and the reporter got hold of guns and demanded a map from him. The smuggler mockingly looked at the reporter, thinking he was going to risk breaking into the prison. Although the prison was only a two-hour drive away, it was heavily guarded. But the reporter had a plan. The smuggler had previously planned to hand them over to the warden. Now they could use this opportunity to switch identities with the smuggler. This way they could easily infiltrate the prison. The tables turned, and the smuggler became the prisoner. Inside the prison, all the death row inmates were called out, including Hopper and the imprisoned guard. They were all a bit stunned, but the prison had a surprise for them, a lavish dinner that seemed like a dream. All the inmates, starving, hurriedly sat down to eat. Only Hopper was unhappy. After drinking a glass of wine, he started to feel dizzy and collapsed on the ground. A veteran among the inmates told them to eat quickly as this might be their last meal. Last week, six people were brought in just like them. They had eaten a hearty meal, but were driven to the enclosure at night and wiped out by a monster. This time, the veteran was confident that if they stood together, they could kill the monster and survive. Hopper awakened and asked about the appearance of the monster. That's when he found out that the monster was the faceless beast that had appeared in Hawkins. He then told his fellow inmates that the prison wasn't providing them with food to give them energy to train the monster, but to provide pleasure for the monster's hunt. Everything they ate would become nourishment for the beast. In short, the prison was rearing a monster. Hopper wasn't ready yet, so he pretended to quarrel with the imprisoned guard when they were taken to the enclosure. The two fought and ended up being beaten by the jailers. They were once again thrown into death row. When the jailers left, Hopper explained to the imprisoned guard that the faceless beast was afraid of fire. That's why he had stolen a bottle of wine while eating earlier and took a lighter from the jailers during the chaos. At the same time, the parents rushed back to Mike's house, hoping to find their children there. After all, they said they were going to see a movie, and by now, they should have returned. However, the house was empty. Mike's mother, worried about the safety of the children, decided to call the police. Meanwhile, the kids were still chatting at Skull Rock. Eddie described the events from the previous night. The targeted boy had died at around 9 p.m., coinciding with the time the flashlight malfunctioned. This suggested that Victor's house in the Upside Down was the murderer's lair. If they could sneak into the Upside Down and find the murderer's true form, killing it there would end everything. Dustin was at the back studying the compass. He figured out why the compass was going wrong. It wasn't malfunctioning. It deviated when they arrived at Skull Rock. This indicated a strong magnetic field nearby. The last time this happened was due to the gate to the Upside Down. Thus, there might be a gate nearby, smaller than the one in the lab. Dustin was excited about his discovery and hurriedly led the way. 
They walked through the forest until nightfall and finally arrived at their destination. Unexpectedly, it was Lover's Lake, where the boy was killed. Nancy recalled that the faceless monster always left a gate connecting the two worlds every time it launched an attack. The murderous monster might do the same. So leaving three kids on the shore to wait for news, Nancy and others went on the adventure. They took the compass and got into the little worn-out boat that Eddie had stolen from the reporter's house, rowing into the lake on a moonless night. When the compass started to go haywire, they estimated that the small gate was right below them, but they had to check. Steve bravely took the lead, stripping to his swimwear. Eddie kindly prepared a flashlight for him. However, when Steve found the small gate, he didn't expect the flesh vines inside to detect a foreign body approaching. Steve tried to swim up quickly, but as soon as he reached the surface, he was dragged into the upside down by the vines. Meanwhile, when the police received Mike's mother's report, they happened to find three children near Lover's Lake. The kids tried to make a run for it, but ended up getting caught. On the boat, the remaining three were worried about Steve and jumped into the lake one after another, entering the upside down through the mini gateway. Steve was tangled up with several bat-like creatures in the upside down. Outnumbered, he was bitten and choked. At the critical moment, Nancy and the other two rush to his rescue. Steve narrowly escapes death, but as more bats are flying towards them from a distance, the four of them have to hide in the nearby forest. Eleven is also in a bad predicament. Ever since the U.S. military caught the agent, the colonel has been torturing him to reveal Eleven's hiding place. The agent resisted revealing at first, but unable to bear the torture, he betrayed Sam. Sam, still arguing with Brenner at the base, claims that Hawkins doesn't have much time left. He had chosen to ally with Brenner only after Brenner said the Nina project was feasible. However, since the experiment started, he saw no sign of Eleven regaining her superpowers. Dr. Brenner fell silent. He knew the progress was slow and speculated that it was related to Eleven's fear. Therefore, he provided her with personal counseling, urging her to face her true self and stop running away. Consequently, Eleven once again geared up to enter Nina. This time, new memories surfaced. After being bullied by others, she experienced a slight concussion. When Brenner examined her and asked who had hurt her, Eleven didn't say, but he had already guessed who it was. He called everyone together and singled out number two, placing a collar around his neck. Number two tried to argue, but his superpowers were restricted. Brenner controlled the remote, causing him to convulse in pain. Now, Eleven became a traitor in everyone's eyes. Only the administrator chatted with her as usual. As the two sat at the table playing chess, the administrator revealed a shocking secret. After number two healed, he would join others in seeking revenge, planning to kill Eleven in the Rainbow Room. All of this was Brenner's plot simply because Eleven was too strong, making Brenner fearful. Therefore, he secretly planned to get rid of her. The administrator advised her to escape and even planned to do so that very day. He'd thought through the escape route and secretly handed an access card to Eleven to help her open doors during her escape. On the day the escape plan started, Brenner took a child to class. Eleven pretended to feel dizzy and asked the guard to take her to the doctor. She took the opportunity to slip away, using the access card to head underground where there's a drainage pipe leading to the outside world. The administrator had already been waiting for a long time. However, he didn't let Eleven leave. He revealed another secret. To control the lab members, Brenner would install trackers in the back of their necks. If the administrator was caught, Eleven's whereabouts would be exposed. So he wanted Eleven to remove the tracker from him before she left. Innocent Eleven believed him again and agreed to his request. As the guards surrounded them, the administrator finally showed his true colors. It turned out the tracker was a device limiting his superpowers. He was the rumored number one test subject. With a flick of his finger, all the guards died. When Eleven emerged from the storeroom, she saw the red lights of the alarm flashing outside, heard painful howls from the intercom, and there were bodies scattered in the hallway. Even Brenner had fainted. In the Rainbow Room, the super-powered children were all dead, their bodies eerily broken. When Eleven burst in, she just saw Number One brutally killing. The truth finally came out. The lab tragedy years ago wasn't committed by Eleven, but by Number One. On the other side, Dustin and the other two were taken back by the police. Knowing that it would be difficult to convince the officers, they claimed to be walking outside at 9 p.m. and denied knowing anything about Eddie. Their statements were surprisingly consistent, making Powell suspicious. Hence, he decided to separate the boys for questioning, hoping to find a breakthrough. In the Upside Down, Nancy and her group managed to hide in the forest for a while until the swarm of bats finally left. 
However, Steve's wounds were getting worse. Without a first aid kit, Nancy could only bandage him up with pieces of clothing. Steve was tough and managed to endure the pain. Robin, familiar with the upside-down setup, suggested they might find weapons at a police station to fight off the bats, but the station was far from their location. Coincidentally, Nancy had stashed two guns in her bedroom, so the group decided to head to Nancy's house. Hopper in the prison was preparing for his escape. He tore a piece of cloth from his cotton jacket and hid it in his pocket. The imprisoned guard was confident about his escape plan this time. Following their previous plan, the reporter and Joyce posed as smugglers to trick the warden and gain entry to the prison. Once inside, the reporter rehearsed his script while waiting for the warden. Fortunately, the reporter's performance was convincing, and his Russian was good enough to keep the warden from suspecting anything. The warden even invited him to watch the monster fights. The death row inmates were led into the arena, and the rules were explained. They could grab weapons like axes and hammers from the cabinet once the buzzer sounded. However, these tools seemed useless against the monsters. The imprisoned guard advised everyone to stay calm and fight in a group according to the plan. Hopper also wrapped the ripped cloth around a stick, pouring alcohol on it. The warden was puzzled, questioning how the prisoners had extra tools. He immediately sent his men to investigate. When the warden returned, the reporter pulled out a gun demanding an immediate end to the games, but the warden would rather die than agree. Moreover, the iron gate confining the monster was already open. The creature attacked the inmates, killing several in seconds. The others were petrified, completely forgetting their combat plan until Hopper lit the cloth, temporarily driving the monster back. The reporter threatened the warden's life to intimidate the others, but the warden gave a deadly order and everyone remained indifferent. Few people were left alive in the arena. Hopper was trying to open the heavy iron door to escape. With no other options, the reporter knocked out the man in the control room. Joyce then randomly pressed buttons on the control panel, miraculously opening the iron door. As Hopper and the imprisoned guard fled inside, Joyce quickly closed the door. The monster was hot on their heels, but before it could squeeze in, Hopper struck it in the mouth with a sharp object, causing it to retreat in pain. Hopper then turned to see Joyce standing behind him. The two reunited friends shared a long-awaited hug, but without a kiss. On the other side, Nancy and her group were still finding their way. To avoid alerting the bats, they made their way cautiously. Just then, the Upside Down experienced another earthquake. The sky turned a red, signaling something ominous. At this moment, Dustin tried to contact them from the bathroom, but no one responded. Lucas suspected they had already entered the Upside Down. Erica learned of the current situation, but she wondered why a portal would appear at the bottom of the lake. Since the incident three years ago, only Eleven and the electromagnetic cannon had opened the door to the Upside Down. At present, Eleven was not in Hawkins, and the electromagnetic cannon had been destroyed. So how did this portal appear? Dustin had an idea. Three years ago, Eleven was able to open the door because she had contacted the faceless monster in the psychic world. If the portal this time was opened by the serial killer, it would imply a psychic connection between the killer and its victims. The power of this connection was strong enough to tear a rift in time and space. This ability was much more potent than the Mind Flayer's, as the Mind Flayer couldn't open a portal on its own. While the trio was discussing this, Steve in the Upside Down heard Dustin's voice. Nancy led the others to her bedroom to retrieve guns, but found only a pair of shoes where the firearm should have been. The room was decorated just like it was three years ago, and her diary was not filled, still open to the day Will disappeared. This indicated that they had traveled back in time. Before Nancy could figure out why, she heard Steve downstairs shouting Dustin's name. When the others arrived, they seemed to hear it too, but Dustin couldn't hear them. Nancy remembered how Will had used lights to communicate with his mother when Will was dragged into the Upside Down. They quickly searched for a lamp, but all the lamps in the house were broken. Surprisingly, there was a glowing residue around the chandelier. When they touched and scraped it, the chandelier in the real world flickered. So they decided to use Morse code for help. Erica was the first to notice the anomaly, and Dustin deciphered the Morse code message as an SOS signal. However, they were not familiar with Morse code and couldn't send a detailed help message. They had to use Mike's sister's toy to make a simple writing board. Whenever Nancy wrote something in the Upside Down, it would appear on the toy's panel. Dustin thus learned that they were trapped in the Upside Down. He had just figured out why the mini doors appeared. There should be a door at each murder scene. Since the door at the bottom of the lake was guarded, Nancy and the others could try their luck at Eddie's uncle's house and return to reality from the door there. 
To assist Nancy and her group, Dustin and the others hurriedly rode their bikes away. Before leaving, they even punctured the tires of the adult's car. In the Upside Down, Nancy and the others were also racing on their bikes. However, their whereabouts were discovered by a bat sentry, and the murderous monster was informed. Despite this, Nancy and her friends managed to reach the caravan area safely. They found an exit in the ceiling, and Dustin pierced the sticky membrane of the exit. Unexpectedly, they could see each other from both sides. Dustin thought that if a rope was thrown down, it should hang vertically. He made a climbing rope from a bedsheet and placed a sponge pad on the floor. Robin and Eddie successfully climbed across, but when it was Nancy's turn, the murderous monster was casting a spell again. Nancy didn't climb up. Instead, she stood there with her eyes turning white. She had fallen into a consciousness space where she saw the decomposing body of her friend who had died in the pool. Blood was pouring into the pool from all around. She quickly climbed out of the pool, but outside it wasn't Steve's house, but the shattered consciousness space of the murderous monster. With the monster's guidance, Nancy finally understood the whole story. In the past, Number One had also shared this secret with Eleven. The murderous monster was originally Henry, the younger son of the Victor family. He was also the test subject, Number One, the one who started the massacre in the lab and a superpowered being. Henry had difficulty fitting in with his peers since childhood, likely facing a lot of school bullying, and was called a freak by teachers and doctors. His family thought a change of environment might help him, so they moved to a mansion in Hawkins. However, while the family was happy about their new home, Henry remained gloomy and aloof. He found a spider's lair in the ventilation ducts of the new house. He believed he was just like them, solitary creatures, but also predators of the world, devouring the weak to restore order to the ecosystem. To Henry, humans were parasites in the world, and the order they established was a form of restraint. The day-to-day -day life made Henry disgusted. Henry was eager to end it all until he discovered that he had superpowers and could create his own rules. So he started training with small actions. When he killed various animals, he realized his powers were beyond imagination. He could not only control life and death, but also explore the memories of living beings before their death. This explained why Victor found many animal carcasses near the mansion. Later, he started targeting his family, making them see illusions repeatedly, until Henry's mother sought experts and wanted to send him to the hospital for treatment. Henry decided to act first. Thus, he used his superpower one night, killing his mother and sister. He also wanted to kill his father, but he overestimated his powers and fainted from overusing his psychic abilities. However, his father was suspected of murder and imprisoned. The unconscious Henry was taken care of by Dr. Brenner, who only wanted to control the superpowered Henry. Later, when he discovered that Henry couldn't be controlled, he started a large-scale plan to cultivate superpowered individuals, looking for special children nationwide until the appearance of Eleven. Her potential was on par with Henry's. Henry thought Eleven was one of his kind and wanted to recruit her. But in Eleven's eyes, she had been deceived by him all along. She decided to fight him at the Rainbow Room. Back then, Eleven was still a child and was no match for Henry. She was beaten badly and almost lost her life. When Henry sensed Eleven's memories, it also awakened her potential. Eleven's emotions exploded in an instant, and her psychic power was stronger than ever before. She subdued Henry finally, reducing him to ashes. However, when Henry's body disappeared, a space-time rift connecting to the Upside Down appeared on the wall behind him. Henry wasn't dead. He fell into the Upside Down through the rift. His body was struck by lightning, eventually turning him into a monstrous being, a wicked serial killer. Nancy is pulled into the world of consciousness by Henry. She learns about his transformation into a monstrous number one. Terrified by his deranged madness, she desperately wants to escape. However, each time she finds an exit and opens the door, she finds herself back at the start. Henry uses flesh tendrils to bind her to a chair, approaches her, and demands that she relay everything she witnesses to Eleven. She experiences visions of the ground collapsing. Each time the mini door expands, a wall clock chimes. Nancy witnesses the destruction of the town, and after a moment of terror, she snaps back to reality. Meanwhile, strange occurrences are happening in the Soviet prison. The faceless creature has inexplicably gone berserk. Joyce and her group cut off the power, forcing the jailers to aim their guns at the faceless creature. However, the creature can climb walls and could wipe out the jailers in minutes. Taking advantage of the chaos in the prison, Joyce treats Hopper's wounds and tries to extract information about an escape route from a researcher. 
However, they get no answers. Instead, during the rampage of the creature, they hear another monster in the room. Hopper cautiously opens the door with his gun and discovers a dissected creature, identical to the faceless creature, lying on the operating table. More horrifyingly, there are seven or eight more of them in jars in the back of the surgery room. After navigating through the corpses of the creatures, they see a moving fog in a container deep within the room, a part of the Mind Flayer. They hadn't expected the Mind Flayer trapped in the Upside Down to still be alive. The group is horrified. The imprisoned guard, however, is focused on finding an escape route and discovers a pipe leading to the outside. After a night of crawling, they finally escape from the prison. They find themselves in a vast expanse, with the outermost sentry not far away. The group successfully escapes by driving straight through the guardrail. They know the prison will send people after them. Hopper plans to fly back to the United States as soon as possible, but they are unfamiliar with the area and still on the run. They are left with no option but to negotiate with a smuggler to secure a plane. The smuggler makes outrageous demands. The imprisoned guard draws their guns and orders him to comply or meet his maker. Forced to comply, the smuggler shows them his plane that has never flown and needs some minor repairs. It doesn't look reliable. Joyce suggests contacting Dr. Sam, who should have contacts here. The problem is how to contact him. The guard has a method for making long-distance calls abroad. Given the situation, they can only call a relay station and ask them to contact Sam. The call could take anywhere from an hour to several days, so they must wait for a reply. There's also a risk of being monitored, so the guard reminds Hopper to communicate in code when the time comes. At this moment, Eleven just finished her training and regained consciousness with the help of a doctor. She feels powerful and walks over to the massive machine, Nina. She stretches out her hand and uses her telekinesis. The lights here flicker constantly, and after screws snap, the machine rises into the air. Fortunately, Eleven knows her limits and doesn't let the machine break through the ground. However, after she gains her superpowers again, Brenner shows his ambition. Back when Henry slaughtered the lab, only the two of them survived. Brenner, watching the battle scene and surveillance video, learns about Eleven's process of fighting Henry. The two of them exhibited powers that Brenner had never seen before. But after Eleven woke up, her potential had mysteriously disappeared. Brenner believes that that kind of energy is hidden inside Eleven, and thus begins various power training. Unexpectedly, Eleven opens the gate to the Upside Down again. Brenner guesses Henry is hiding in the Upside Down, hence the exploration begins. It isn't until the serial killings in Hawkins that Brenner's guess is confirmed. Even Sam thinks of Henry the moment he sees the exploded corpse. He reassures Eleven that her friends in Hawkins are safe at the moment. But Brenner starts to undermine this, suggesting that every time Henry kills a person, he carves a hole in the barrier between the two worlds. If the number of holes increases, the barrier will crack. This means the crack will expand and the barrier will collapse like a termite mound. Then Hawkins Town will fall. Upon hearing this speculation, Eleven rushes to her room to use her powers and check on her friends in Hawkins. Nancy and Steve have already escaped the Upside Down and are squatting at Max's house, telling their story. They tell everyone that Henry will open four mini doors in Hawkins, which will continue to expand and connect the two worlds. Then, he will send a horde of monsters into Hawkins to hunt humans. Mike recalls hearing four chimes in his consciousness, which were hints from Henry all along. If Henry achieves his goal, it will be the end of the world. Now, he has already killed three people and opened three doors. He is only one step away from completing his plan. The kids want to contact Joyce to discuss it, but no one answers the phone. Dustin guesses that Joyce is in trouble. The crisis at hand can only be resolved by them. Nancy decides to go back to the Upside Down and kill Henry. Once he dies, the plan will naturally end. However, Henry's powers are too strong. He can kill with a flick of his finger. Even if they take firepower and fight hard, it would just be a suicide mission. Therefore, Steve and Eddie don't agree with Nancy's idea. In the midst of their arguing, Dustin comes up with a brilliant idea. Henry and Eleven have the same powers, so they should have the same weaknesses. Every time Eleven uses her powers, it's like her soul is leaving her body, and her body loses the ability to act, making it the most vulnerable time. This could explain why Henry liked to stay in the attic when he was young. Now, they just need to set a trap to make Henry use his powers, then distract the Bat Army from the Upside Down. They will then have the opportunity to kill Henry's physical body. Considering that Henry's killings are random, they can only risk setting a trap with Max as bait. She volunteers to attract Henry's attention and buy time for her companion's actions. But before the action begins, they need to prepare enough tools. Eddie knows a shop that sells guns and ammunition. 
Later, they steal a camper van from a nearby couple and rush to the shop. To avoid attracting the police's attention, the group can only take the back roads. Eleven, having learned about the plan, couldn't wait to plead with Sam to send her back to Hawkins. However, their conversation was overheard by Brenner. He knew all too well of Henry's ruthlessness and was reluctant to let Eleven leave his side. He tried to persuade her to stay, but Sam assured that he could contact his assistant who had connections at the Air Force Base just a two-hour drive away. As long as Eleven left now, she would be guaranteed to make it to Hawkins before nightfall. Eleven immediately went to pack her bags, and Sam made a call to his assistant, asking her to prepare a plane and arrange for someone to look after the kids at Max's house. Unexpectedly, their conversation was cut short, and Sam was taken away by a group of security guards. Eleven went to say goodbye to Nina, but the main door suddenly closed. Brenner emerged from behind, telling Eleven that she couldn't leave and that Sam would be killed if she did. Outside was an endless desert. Even if Eleven disregarded Sam's safety, she would get lost in the desert. Eleven saw through Brenner's intentions. All he had ever wanted was to bring back Henry. He released Eleven's telekinetic power just to guide her into the conscious space to find Henry. But the result was uncontrollable. Due to Brenner's act, the town of Hawkins once fell into danger and is now facing an apocalyptic outcome. Crying, Eleven gave Brenner a tongue lashing, claiming that the monster is actually Brenner. Eleven then attempted to open the door to save Sam, but was ambushed by Brenner, who injected her with an anesthetic, causing her to pass out. When she woke up, she had been fitted with a collar that suppressed her abilities and was confined to her room with nowhere to go. However, Brenner didn't anticipate the arrival of the group of four led by Jonathan. They had obtained Nina's coordinates through Susie and were driving a pickup truck on the road. In the rush of the emergency rescue, Will expressed his desire to go to Vegas with Eleven and Mike after everything was over. However, Mike was filled with worry. After nine hours of driving, Jonathan hadn't reached the destination yet and began to doubt if they had the wrong coordinates. They stopped to study the map, and the pizza man was wandering around the area. Unexpectedly, he stumbled upon tire tracks and quickly followed them. Meanwhile, the colonel managed to force an agent to reveal Eleven's hiding place. Now, he was also leading an armed force towards the Nina base. On the other side, Steve was driving the RV, taking everyone to the store to buy equipment. Lucas was somewhat unsettled. He didn't want Max to take risks and proposed finding a likely victim to replace her. But Max refused this suggestion. She was prepared and planned to lure Henry out and then hide in a happy memory, rendering Henry, who attacks using people's darkness, unable to hurt her. Soon they arrived at the store, splitting up to quickly get what they needed. However, they unexpectedly ran into Jason, who was also there buying weapons. Not wanting to provoke this lunatic, Nancy made an excuse and they slipped away. Next, they went to the outskirts to use the materials to create props. Dustin and Eddie made shields to block bats. Lucas and his sister made spears, while Steve and Robin used bottles to make Molotov cocktails. Nancy practiced shooting in the open field. Although they were preparing at the last minute, they seemed confident about the imminent battle and enjoyed an afternoon full of fun. The colonel's army had already reached the base, triggering alarms. People in the base were caught off guard due to lack of preparation and inadequate weapons. The defense team that Brenner had painstakingly established was easily wiped out. Concerned for Eleven's safety, Brenner ushered everyone to escape through a secret tunnel. Therefore, when the colonel arrived inside the base, he only found Dr. Sam locked in the office, while Brenner and Eleven had already surfaced. However, they found the bodies of the researchers lying around. There was also a plane outside shooting, killing anyone who emerged alive from the base. Even Brenner became a target and fell to the ground under the sniper's continuous attack. Eleven was dazed due to the collar's restrictions and was helpless. The sniper dared not harm her rashly and was asking the colonel for permission to shoot. Upon hearing this, Sam stopped them, claiming that he could subdue Eleven. If there were more crimes in Hawkins, he would personally send Eleven on her way. But if not, Eleven would be their strongest combat force. Unfortunately, the colonel had long lost trust in Sam and still issued the kill order. However, just as the sniper was preparing to act, the gang led by Jonathan arrived just in time. This distracted the sniper, and by the time he aimed at Eleven again, she had already gotten up and was struggling to break free from the collar. Although she couldn't exert her full strength, Eleven managed to disrupt the sniper's aim using her powers. She then extended her hands, causing the plane to lose control and crash from the sky, creating a huge explosion in the desert. 
At this moment, Jonathan had just driven the car over. Mike hurriedly held his girlfriend, and as they hugged, the pizza man was stunned by his first encounter with a super-powered girl. Brenner finally changed his mind at the last moment. He unlocked the collar, setting Eleven free. Eleven and Mike got on the pizza truck and finally left the Nina base. When the colonel came out, he only saw the dust from the departing vehicle, but the battle wasn't over. Eleven wanted to return to Hawkins that night, otherwise her friends there would be in danger. The group she was worried about was already prepared and was driving to Victor's house. Everyone in the car was solemn, but they had no regrets and didn't back down. Hopper and his crew escaped from the prison. They had planned to return to their country on the smuggler's airplane, but the smuggler had other plans. Despite verbally agreeing to give up his plane, he sneakily stashed away a crucial part during the repair process. Testing the aircraft's functionality, the reporter and the guard conversed, noting something amiss with the sound of the plane. They suspected the smuggler of sabotage and tried to intervene. The smuggler denied any wrongdoing, challenging them to fix it themselves if they thought they knew better. The reporter was at a loss on how to deal with the smuggler. Meanwhile, Hopper and Joyce were waiting for a phone call. Hopper had found a change of clothes for both of them. Joyce covertly observed Hopper, the scars covering his body evoking a sense of melancholy. Just as the atmosphere was reaching a peak, the phone rang. The caller was Sam's assistant. After a coded exchange, Hopper learned that Sam, Eleven, and others had all gone missing. He associated this with the upside down. Joyce, thinking about the living creatures in the prison, realized they had a hive mind. If the gate to the upside down was closed, they would be deactivated. Their reactivation indicated a new gate had opened in Hawkins. Upon hearing this, Hopper realized the urgency of the situation. They needed to rush home to help. However, even if they left immediately, it would not be soon enough. Joyce realized they didn't necessarily need to go back. Due to the hive mind of the creatures, eliminating the monster in the prison would still inflict considerable damage. This could provide the children with a significant advantage in the battle. Hopper decided to return to the prison. He took the smuggler's weapons, including a flamethrower. He asked the guard to stay and oversee the aircraft repair, while he, Joyce, and the reporter headed for the prison. As for Eleven and her group, they initially planned to rush back to Hawkins that night. However, they were unable to purchase airplane tickets. Eleven, gazing at a roadside poster, recalled her mother and Billy, who she could find in the realm of consciousness when unable to communicate in the real world. If she could replicate this process and enter Max's consciousness, she could engage in a mental battle with Henry, ensuring Max's safety, even if they were not in Hawkins. However, to maximize her fighting power, she needed to submerge herself in a sensory deprivation tank, which requires a large amount of salt. The pizza shop where the pizza man worked had enough to supply. Therefore, the group went to the pizza shop late at night, closed the doors and windows, emptied the freezer, filled it with water, and poured in the salt. In between, the pizza man found time to make pizzas for dinner. Meanwhile, Nancy and the group were also ready. According to their plan, Max and Lucas were to stay on standby at the Victor house. Erica would signal with lights from the outside, while the rest would infiltrate the upside down. They would wait for Max to lure Henry into the realm of consciousness, and then the group in the upside down could make their next move. Dustin and Eddie would distract the bats, allowing the others to sneak into Victor's house in upside down and find Henry's physical body. They planned to torch him using a Molotov cocktail. After finalizing their steps, the plan was set into action. Nancy and the group successfully entered the Upside Down. Max and Lucas also reached Victor's house in the real world. They were carrying lanterns to find traces of Henry. Erica then ran outside to signal, but a passerby happened to see the group acting suspiciously. He passed the news on to Jason. Eddie and the rest knew they couldn't directly confront the Bat Army. They needed to create a safe house. Hence, they decided to modify Eddie's uncle's house in the Upside Down. Once the bats were lured, they could hide inside. Nancy, Steve, and Robin headed towards the house in the Upside Down. They saw a beam of light not far away at a playground. That was Erica's location. Now, as long as the trio approached the beam of light, they could hear Erica's voice. Inside the house, Max and Lucas were still communicating through notes. Max was ready. She walked to the spot where Henry had been, took off her headphones, switched off the tape player, and taunted the air. Sure enough, Henry took the bait under Max's mockery. Following the flickering lights, Max went up to the attic. On Eleven's side, she and Mike were still having a sweet moment when the pizza man's pizza was served. Will and his brother were stirring the salt water. Jonathan knew what his younger brother was going through and suggested that they should talk when they have a chance. Will was moved to tears, but his mood quickly improved. He then called over Eleven. Everything was ready. 
Eleven put on the blindfold Mike had made for her. Her whole body was floating in the salt water. Using the recorder nearby, she entered the realm of consciousness and found Max, who was in the attic. Max's taunting didn't draw Henry out, so she had to reveal her dark side. She claimed that she had always hated her brother Billy and wanted to get rid of him, even to the point of death. That's why she stood by when the spider monster attacked Billy, but this also made her feel guilty and unable to forgive herself. Suddenly, Lucas challenged her if what she said was true. Max quickly explained, but Lucas continued to berate her, saying it was a good thing she was taken by Henry. She was one in a million, the fourth sacrifice, perfect for breaking this world. But Lucas's voice gradually deepened. Max sensed something strange. The real Lucas saw Max with her eyes rolled back, soullessly sitting on the floor, and he shouted at her anxiously. In the realm of consciousness, Eleven spotted the unfolding scene. She knew Henry was there. As expected, Lucas in the form of Henry started to go berserk. Max managed to reveal Henry's true form by hitting him with a candlestick. Terrified, Max started to run, her body shaking uncontrollably. Seeing this, Eleven grabbed Max's hand and exerted her power to delve deeper into the space. This time, they arrived at a segment of Max's memory. Meanwhile, Lucas signaled Erica to alert the others that Henry had been drawn away. This meant the next phase of the plan could begin. So Eddie picked up his guitar and started a solo performance on the roof of the trailer. The loud music caught the attention of the Bat Army. As the bats flew away, Nancy and her two companions took the chance to sneak into Henry's lair. While Eddie was strumming his guitar, Max was still fleeing for her life in the house. She opened one door after another, only to find them either nailed shut or leading to a wall. Behind one of the doors was a sauna room where an enraged Billy was ramming the door frame. This was clearly a reenactment of Max's memory. Knowing that everything around her wasn't real, she decided to think of some pleasant memories instead. As Billy burst out of the sauna room, Max instantly found herself at the school's dance scene. However, Jason had arrived at the house. Erica, spotting a car approaching in the distance, tried to divert Jason's attention, but she couldn't run fast, and there were no hiding spots nearby. She was quickly caught by Jason's accomplices. Meanwhile, Eddie's sonic guitar attack worked, attracting all the bats to the trailer. Lucas and Eddie hid inside the trailer at the last moment. Having successfully diverted the bats, they joyfully jumped around on the spot. On the other side, Hopper and his two companions hurried back to the prison. As they passed through the gate, they found it strange that the jailers were gone. The only sounds were gunshots and screams coming from the walkie-talkie. Even without the jailers, they chose not to break in through the main entrance, but instead crawled in through an underground pipe. Regrettably, they were too late. The incubation tanks in the lab had been shattered, and the creatures had already escaped. Hopper, leading with a flamethrower, quickly discovered the dead bodies of the researchers and jailers. The warden was lying on the ground, barely alive. He told Hopper that when the faceless creature was causing chaos in the enclosure, the jailers fired back, accidentally shattering the incubation tank, waking all the creatures inside. Several monsters hunted throughout the prison. The reporter pressed the warden, asking who had been entered, but the warden died at the crucial moment. Suddenly, they heard the monsters roar from outside. The three of them grabbed their weapons in alert. The reporter, staring at the computer monitor, understood the warden's words. The fluff from the upside down must have entered the body of the faceless creature. This would explain why the monster's corpse could come back to life. At this moment, Nancy and her two companions opened the door to the house in the upside down. Inside, tendrils were winding all around. Due to the collective consciousness, they couldn't step on the tendrils to reach the attic, and the places they could step on were quite limited. Just as the trio managed to climb the stairs, and they were only a door away from the attic, the house suddenly started shaking. A tendril took advantage of their distraction, wrapping around Robin's ankle and binding her to the wall. Nancy and Steve rushed to help, but they too were entangled by the tendrils. The other two groups also ran into trouble. As Erica was captured, Jason discovered the house's attic. He found Lucas and Max there. He had a deep resentment for the satanic cult and believed Lucas was planning to sacrifice Max. Despite his fear, he pointed his gun at Lucas and demanded that he snap Max out of her state. Lucas could only explain that if Max woke up now, everyone would die. Jason didn't believe his bullshit. If Lucas didn't comply, he would pull the trigger. Lucas had to cut to the chase, trying to calm Jason down while revealing the truth about why Chrissy had died. 
Jason was in such panic that he couldn't take it all in. He thought Lucas was making excuses. However, Lucas kept his composure. Since he couldn't persuade Jason, he decided to use force and attacked when Jason was off guard. However, during their struggle, the tape player was crushed under Jason's foot. Lucas was also beaten one-sidedly. Only his sister Erica managed to escape the control of Jason's accomplices. Dustin and Eddie were also in a tight spot. Although they managed to hide in a camper van and had reinforced it, the attacking bats kept increasing in number. One even managed to squeeze through a ventilation duct. The two tried to drive it away with their bayonets, finally using a shield to block the entrance. However, there were more vents in the camper van, and another was already overflowing with bats. The two had no choice but to fight their way back, planning to return to the real world from the living room. Yet after Dustin returned, Eddie did not. Watching the ferocious attack of the bats, he decided to buy time for his companions by playing the hero. He cut the rope that connected the two worlds, picked up the remaining equipment, opened the door, and lured away the bats on a bicycle. On the other side, Eleven could only find a young Max skating in her memory. She couldn't see or hear Eleven. There was no trace of Henry around either, but there was a table on a nearby ramp that seemed out of place. Eleven guessed that the table was a part of a memory related to the dance hall. Max was sitting anxiously in the dance hall when suddenly balloons burst. Spilling blood plasma and music started playing for no reason. When Eleven walked onto the bridge, she discovered two record players on the table, playing the same song that had been playing the night Henry killed his family. Henry found Max. The upside down's tendrils and floating fluff filled the dance floor. Dark clouds gathered in the sky with lightning flashing and thunder roaring. Max tried to block the entrance by jamming it with a chair, but when she turned around, the chairs had all disappeared and the door had changed form. Max quickly thought of pleasant memories, trying to hide deeper within her conscious space. But this time, Henry saw through her plan, continuously showing her the predicaments her friends were in. Unable to concentrate, Max opened her eyes to find she was still in the same place. Henry appeared behind her, using telekinesis to pin her against the wall, telling her time was up. But just as he was about to cast a spell, he was sent flying uncontrollably. It turned out Eleven had arrived. Henry was caught off guard. Unfortunately, Eleven didn't finish him off when she had the chance. All Henry received was a beating, and when he stood back up, he was unharmed. Eleven was unaware of the gap in strength between her and Henry. She went in for the attack but was unable to land a blow. Max rushed in to help but was knocked out instantly. Henry took control of Eleven's body and threw her into his blood-red consciousness space. Henry wanted Eleven to watch her friends die. He used the tendrils to bind her limbs and then brought the unconscious Max in as well. Eleven couldn't defeat Henry. She decided to try to reason with him, to use love to change him. But Henry was too corrupted and showed no sign of being moved. After being thrown into the Upside Down by Eleven, he initially thought he had arrived in Purgatory. To his surprise, it was a new world. He explored every corner of the Upside Down, seeing the faceless creatures that lived there and the massive dark clouds floating in the sky. He saw the potential in the dark clouds and used his telekinesis to reshape them into a black spider. Thus, the Mind Flayer was created. That's why all the bizarre incidents occurred in Hawkins. The root cause was Henry's meddling. He wanted to use Eleven's power to open the gate to the Upside Down. No wonder Billy, when being controlled, said that everything they built was for Eleven. Eleven finally saw Henry for who he truly was, but it didn't make any difference at the moment. She was trapped, and her friends were in danger. Dustin discovered Eddie's plan and, unwilling to let him risk his life alone, decided to venture back into the Upside Down. But by the time he returned, Eddie had been caught by the bats. He could have escaped by abandoning his bike, but he chose to stay and face the swarm of bats alone. As expected, he was overwhelmed. On his way to aid Eddie, Dustin saw him surrounded by bats. Outnumbered, Eddie's limbs were tied up by the bats, and he no longer had the strength to fight back. Lucas was beaten up by Jason, his face bloody. His sister Erica was running towards the attic, seemingly too late to come to his rescue. Meanwhile, Hopper in the Soviet prison was also in danger. He had intended to deal with the creatures by luring them into an enclosed area and burning them all with a flamethrower. Since these monsters shared a collective consciousness, luring one would draw all the others out. He decided to act as bait and gave the flamethrower to the reporter. Joyce stayed in the surveillance room to monitor the situation and planned to activate the enclosure to trap the monsters. The closest monster to the surveillance room was in the laundry room, gnawing on a corpse. Joyce, watching the monitor, was reminded of the scene when her boyfriend Bob was killed and couldn't help worrying about Hopper's safety. 
Hopper could only assure her, reminding her that they still had a sweet date after everything was over. After giving Joyce a smelly kiss, he headed alone to the laundry room. The faceless creature was feasting when it saw Hopper and threw him to the ground. Hopper could only use his hands to hold off the monster's gaping maw. As for Nancy and her friends, they were choked by tendrils and seemed to be on the verge of suffocation. Eleven fell into despair. She watched helplessly as Henry approached Max and started to cast a spell. In the real world, Max's body began to float. Eleven convulsed as if drowning, leaving Mike at a loss of what to do. Will reminded Mike that he was the core of their group. So Mike began to confess his feelings, saying the words Eleven had been waiting to hear for a long time. He would suffer if she was in pain, and he couldn't live without her. After listening to Mike's confession, Eleven perked up. Her strength returned. She concentrated her mind and unlocked the tendrils that bound her hands and feet. Lucas, seeing Max's body rise into the air, was inspired to fight for love. In an instant, he knocked out Jason. Unfortunately, it all seemed too late. Henry's spell casting was in its final stages. By the time Eleven broke free and sent Henry flying, Max had already had her limbs broken. Her body fell from a high altitude. Joyce stunned the creature with an electric rod, and she and Hopper together lured the creature into the enclosure, while the reporter used the flamethrower to burn the horde of monsters. Dusty had just arrived by Eddie's side. He saw only the bat army downed. Eddie was lying on the ground, barely alive. He smiled and said his last words to Dusty. Nancy and the others had just escaped from the tendrils. They hurried into the attic, prepared to burn Henry's body. Henry, restrained in the conscious space, knew that he was doomed, but he kept babbling to Eleven. Though Henry died, his death marked the beginning of the endgame, implying that there is more to come. The scene shifted to Hopper with a sword that killed the last creature. A Molotov cocktail was thrown at Henry's body, and his body was engulfed in flames. After his consciousness returned to his body, he tried to resist, but was shot back by Nancy. Eventually, he fell from the window of the attic. When Nancy and the others ran out, only remnants of the fire remained. Mysteriously, Henry's body had disappeared. Erica also broke into the attic. Lucas, holding Max, hurriedly asked his sister to call an ambulance. Max was unconscious, her face covered in blood. She painfully said she didn't want to die, but soon stopped breathing. Eleven, seeing this scene in the conscious space, was powerless to help. After Max's last breath, the clock of the Upside Down suddenly tolled. A small door opened in the attic, and Jason's body was in the center, cut in two. Subsequently, the four small doors located in Hawkins began to extend outward. Wherever they went, the ground collapsed and nothing grew. The whole town was undergoing an earthquake. When the four doors intersected at the center, two paths that connected the two worlds finally opened. At this moment, Eleven is still immersed in grief. She doesn't want to lose Max, so she uses her psychic powers to trace their shared memories, and her mind is filled with their wonderful experiences together. Two days later, Jonathan, Will, Eleven, and the Pizza Man return to Hawkins. The town is no longer the same. Due to the earthquake disaster, many people have fled, leaving even more people homeless. The hospital is packed with the injured, and the uninformed public blames everything on a satanic cult, labeling the Hellfire Club as the culprit behind it all. When Nancy sees Jonathan return, she rushes to embrace him. Now, with their misunderstanding cleared, they are once again a loving couple. Will doesn't see Lucas and learns that he is at the hospital with Max. Max's heart had stopped for a minute. Although she narrowly escaped death, she was brought to the hospital but showed no signs of waking up. She might be in a vegetative state forever, and the doctors can't diagnose the reason. It is probably related to Eleven's final exertion of power. She didn't tell Lucas and sits by the hospital bed, using her psychic powers as if searching for something. Meanwhile, Dustin, Steve, and Robin are transporting supplies to the aid center. The three of them decided to stay and volunteer. Steve is in charge of distributing clothes to the townspeople, and Robin helps make food. Unexpectedly, Robin bumps into the girl she has a crush on. The girl is in a band with Robin and had been dating another guy, but they have broken up. The girl talks as fast as Robin does, but Robin doesn't mind and seems to show signs of pursuing her. When Steve once again ventured into the upside-down world, he injured his leg and now walks with a limp. He sees Eddie's uncle posting missing person flyers for Eddie and quickly approaches him to tell Eddie's story and hand over Eddie's last belongings. Eddie's uncle listens to Steve, crying uncontrollably. Soon after, Nancy and the others return to the forest cabin, intending to fix it up for Eleven. The place has been a mess since it was destroyed by the spider creature last time, but luckily the running water is still functional, so cleaning is not a problem. 
The pizza man doesn't participate. He runs off into the forest to collect mushrooms, probably intending to experiment with a new pizza flavor. Mike and Will are sweeping the floor inside the house. As they chat on the sofa, Will claims that Henry isn't dead. As soon as he stepped into Hawkins, he could sense him. Henry is just severely injured and hiding. He won't stop unless he destroys everything. Just as he finishes speaking, a car suddenly pulls up outside. Eleven, who is tidying up the house, doesn't notice. Seeing the soda bottle they used when playing games with Max, she suddenly recalls the spell at the hospital. She enters Max's consciousness space, but it's pitch black. No matter how loudly she calls for Max, she receives no response. Snapping back to reality, she hears the sound of a door opening outside. It's Hopper, wearing his duckbill hat, returning safely. Her father, who is both strict and loving towards her, is back by Eleven's side. The father and daughter are both excited by their reunion. Outside, Joyce and her two sons are reunited. Seeing Eleven coming out, they can't help but embrace her. After the brief joy of reunion, Will suddenly feels a chill at the back. Then a flurry of fluff falls over Hawkins. They step out of the forest to see that the vibrant greenery and flowers on the outskirts have mostly withered. Over Hawkins, dark clouds swirl and lightning flickers, signs of strange events happening. And here ends season four of this drama. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.